Welcome everyone. Thank you for another afternoon with Professor Aaron Prophet, who's the Associate Professor of Japanese Studies at the University of Albany, SUNY. Uh, we are really very fortunate because he's been running a series of talks on Buddhism. And uh, uh, today he's going to do a talk on other power. And I think this is a very uh, interesting talk because uh, as a Jodo Shinshu Buddhist, uh, this is very close to my heart. So I'll let Aaron uh, proceed. So thank you very much, Aaron, for today's lecture. And uh, uh, thank you, Hoshina, and uh, everyone involved with the American Buddhist Studies Center. I, I really enjoy getting to uh, share what I've spent, you know, my entire adult life learning um, uh, and uh, exploring. It's, a, it's truly a pleasure uh, to, to teach and to share, uh, you know, uh, it, 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 in this format as well. And so today I'm going to be thinking through some issues um, that I've been working through, uh, thinking about other power, right? Uh, so this talk is on other power. Uh, it, is the, it is our most recent installment in our Introduction to Buddhism series. Uh, so far, we've covered life and teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha uh, and Shinran, as well as introductions to Mahayana Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Esoteric Buddhism, and Pure Land Buddhism, as well as Buddhist traditions of China, Korea, Japan, and Tibet. Today, we'll be exploring the concept known as other power, which is one of the most interesting and potentially perplexing topics uh, in, um, uh, in Buddhism. Okay. So, <clears throat> first things first. When we tend to talk about other power, we often start from the position of the Pure Land tradition, as understood from the Shin Buddhist perspective. Uh, for those of you who are new to this stuff, uh, Pure Land Buddhism is a prominent dimension of Mahayana Buddhism, uh, which we find in places like the Himalayas and East Asia. In Mahayana Buddhism, there are, uh, it is sometimes debated um, you know, about how exactly progress is made along the path to enlightenment. Um, do I rely on my own power and will, slowly perfecting myself, uh, or is my progress along the path, in some sense, supported by other beings? Um, <clears throat> uh, especially Buddhas and Bodhisattvas working uh, on my behalf in, in somewhat mysterious ways. Diverse perspectives seek to answer this question in various ways. Uh, in this presentation, I'll be examining other power within the diversity of Mahayana Buddhist thought, focusing on medieval Japan, where Shinran proposed his radical reading of other power, arguing that not only our awakening, but our, also our ability to practice is in some profound sense an expression of the compassionate activity of ultimate reality. Okay. Let's start with the popular... Mahayana text, the Sukhavati Vyuha Sutra, or the larger Pure Land Sutra. Uh, once upon a time, uh, the Buddha Shakyamuni sat absorbed in deep meditation. His disciples asked him, Hey Buddha, what you thinking about? You look luminous. To which the Buddha responded by telling the tale of Dharmakara Bodhisattva. Now, we, here we have a story within a story. Once upon a time, there was a king. The king learned that there was a Buddha residing in his land named Lokishvara Raja. Upon learning this, the king renounced his throne to pursue the Buddhist path to awakening. Taking the name Dharmakara, this seeker king uh, aspired not only to pursue the path to liberation for himself, but also wished to create the conditions for all beings to pursue the path more easily. Under Lokishvara Raja's tutelage, Dharmakara, now a bodhisattva, a being on the path to Buddhahood, studied the manifold worlds in the Mahayana multiverse. In Mahayana texts, it is taken for granted that our world is not the only world, and our Buddha is not the only Buddha. There are limitless worlds in the ten directions of the multiverse. Some worlds are flawed or impure like ours, though the Luda Sutra and Vimalakirti Sutra have interesting things to say on this. Some worlds are purified and lack hell realms, hungry ghosts, and any form of unfortunate birth. Others are mixed in terms of purity and impurity. All Buddhas and advanced bodhisattvas purify their spheres of influence and produce pure lands in accord with their vows along the path. Dharmakara decided to make a pure land that would include all the best qualities of all the best purified lands. 
In order to accomplish this goal, he endeavored in meditation for many cosmic eons, growing in perfection until his vows were fulfilled, producing a pure land known as Sukhavati, the land of bliss. Dharmakara made 48 vows delineating the qualities of his pure land and the ease with which beings from all lands may be born there to pursue the bodhisattva path more easily. One of these vows, known as the primal vow, states that beings that are mindful of him will ultimately attain birth in that pure land. In other words, our ability to be born in the pure land is made possible by the ongoing power of the vow made by this bodhisattva, motivated by perfect wisdom and compassion. We call this vow power. I think that's a cool word. Okay. After telling the story of Dharmakara, the Buddha of our world, Shakyamuni, tells his disciples that Dharmakara, the bodhisattva, did indeed successfully accomplish his many vows, and thus became a Buddha named Amitabha, which means limitless light, uh, or Amitayus, meaning limitless light. No, I'm sorry, Amitabha meaning limitless light, or Amitayus meaning limitless life. Throughout the Mahayana Sutras and Tantras, many commentaries, um, uh, throughout, throughout Mahayana Sutras and Tantras and many commentaries, aspiration for rebirth in the pure land of bliss is one of the most sought after spiritual goals. Some sutras, like the Medicine Buddha Sutra, which is obviously about the pure land of the Medicine Buddha, um, even tell us that one of the benefits of that sutra is that beings may be, be born in Amitabha's pure land, Sukhavati. Uh, moreover, in Tibetan Buddhism and East Asian Buddhist traditions, there are diverse perspectives on the nature of the Buddha Amitabha, the nature of the pure land, and the many rituals and mantras, dadani, spells, meditation, and visualization practices that are said to lead to rebirth there. One of the interesting issues found within Mahayana Buddhist culture is how to understand the nature of Buddhist practice and the degree to which we, we may rely upon our own efforts and the degree to which we can rely on the power of Buddhas and bodhisattvas like Amitabha. Okay, now let's dig a little deeper. <clears throat> what are Buddhas anyway? Are they floating golden dudes far beyond our world uh, whose power we may call upon? Or are Buddhas in some sense um, our own true nature? Uh, is it both? Uh, is it neither? Is it both, both and neither or something else? These are some of the fun questions we get to wrestle with if we choose to wrestle with Buddhist philosophy. Uh, or perhaps these questions wrestle with us. <clears throat> According to some traditions, on his deathbed, Shakyamuni said, um, <clears throat> the true Buddha uh, is not uh, this physical form, but rather the Dharma itself is the true Buddha. The Dharma is the Buddhist teachings that lead beings to understand reality and thus attain nirvana or liberation. In developed Mahayana traditions, the Buddha Dharma is in some sense synonymous with that reality which it describes. And nirvana is not separate from ordinary reality, but rather ordinary reality seen from what it is, is nirvana. And ordinary beings seen for what they are, are Buddhas. <clears throat> The Buddha then, the true Buddha, is reality itself, ultimate reality, and we are part of it, and it is what constitutes us in some fundamental sense. This ultimate reality, this universal Buddha, is known as Dharmakaya. Some traditions emphasize the ineffability of Dharmakaya. Ultimate reality is ultimately unknowable. And yet, some traditions emphasize the idea that Dharmakaya teaches. Dharmakaya is active in the world guiding beings to awaken in diverse forms according to the needs and capacities of beings. Some traditions even argue that all beings in body, speech, and mind are actually manifestations of Dharmakaya, and through Buddhist practice we may come to understand this mysterious unity. Uh, painting in very broad strokes, we can see this idea, or something like it, in various Mahayana traditions. The idea that our progress along the path is fundamentally guided by ultimate reality itself. Mahayana Buddhism also emphasizes the teaching of shunyata and the two truths. Shunyata, often translated as emptiness, uh, but I prefer the term openness, distills fundamental Mahayana concepts. First, the teaching of not-self, the idea that all things, our selves included, 
lack any fundamental, unchanging essence and are thus fluid. Second, the teaching of dependent origination, the idea that all things are dependent upon other things, no thing is independent, all things are composite and impermanent. Shunyata refers to the idea of a lack of an inherent, unchanging quality. The famous Indian philosopher we associate with the concept Shunyata, Nagarjuna, once said, For whom Shunyata is possible, all things are possible. In other words, when we are able to see beyond the idea that things or people are static or set in their ways, or in possession of some inherent, unchanging quality, when we're able to see beyond that, we are free. When you see beyond self-imposed limitations, you see the underlying limitlessness. Key to this teaching of Shunyata is the teaching of the two truths, that Nirvana, the state of peace and bliss, is not apart from our ordinary reality. Shunyata is not a metaphysical reality apart from our ordinary reality, but rather is our ordinary reality seen for what it is, beyond the limiting filter of our ordinary consciousness. From this perspective, ultimate reality, Buddha, Nirvana, whatever, is woven into the very fabric of reality and thus beings have an inherent capacity to awaken to this reality. We call this capacity Buddha nature, which you might think of as ultimate reality within and without. Now, back to the Pure Land. What does Pure Land and Shunyata have to do with each other? At first glance, on the surface, it may seem that the Pure Land and the philosophy of Shunyata are about as far away from each other as two things can be. Um, from the Pure Land perspective, we may aspire to be reborn in the purified world of a cosmic Buddha who helps us along the way. In Shunyata, we have a thoroughgoing deconstruction of our very conceptualization of objects in the world, including distinctions between ultimate reality and ordinary reality, as well as between Buddhas and ordinary beings. But, as it turns out, there are many, many Buddhists for whom Pure land thought and practice and the philosophy of Shunyata fit together perfectly. Some of the major transmitters of Prajnaparamita Sutras, some of the earliest Mahayana texts we can date that deal extensively with Shunyata, as well as Madhyamaka philosophy, the philosophical tradition derived from the Shunyata teachings of Nagarjuna, the Zen tradition, Tiantai uh, Buddhism, as well as the esoteric Buddhist traditions, all draw upon, which draw upon the Tantras. <clears throat> Um, have each produced important works thinking through Pure Land thought and practice. Nagarjuna himself is commonly regarded as a Pure Land aspirant throughout the Mahayana world. One of the threads that ties these diverse traditions together is the idea that this world, this mind, is no more real than the Pure Land described in the sutras. In many traditions, meditation practice is designed to produce mystical visions of the Buddha Amitabha and his pure land. And in this way, beings realize the shunyata of the mind, the pure land, and all phenomena, while also describing the attainment of rebirth in the pure land. Buddhists and ordinary beings are not separate from each other. Rather, we could see this perspective as promoting the idea that we call upon the Buddha, the Buddha responds. Having attained such a vision, one has confidence, or faith, in the teachings. One knows that pure land slash nirvana is certain. The drama of Bodhisattva Dharmakara thus becomes a symbol for the underlying unity of ultimate reality and ordinary reality. Amitabha Buddha as an object of devotion becomes a dynamic living symbol for the mind in its true form, an expression of ultimate reality. And the concept of other power indicates that ultimate reality, shunyata, nirvana, buddha, is active, dynamic, as a living life force in which beings are participating. Within the Pure Land tradition, uh, Tan Luan is often associated with the concept of other power. Tan Luan also drew upon Nagarjuna in the philosophy of shunyata, and recently scholars have argued that it is important to keep in mind uh, that when thinking about his and other Chinese Pure Land Patriarch's perspectives that they're drawing upon this idea of Shunyata left and right, sometimes in you know, somewhat covert ways, or ways that might surprise the modern reader.
<clears throat> Tiantai Juri is one of the most important figures in East Asian uh, Buddhist history. Juri drew upon the Madhyamaka teachings of Nagarjuna and systematized diverse meditation and doctrinal systems uh, found throughout China at the time. Juri added to Nagarjuna's two truths a third truth, the truth of the model, uh, the, the, the truth of the middle. Sorry. This idea takes Nagarjuna's observation that ultimate reality and ordinary reality are ultimately one, uh, one and the same, and proposed a middle tradition, a middle position from which um, both ultimate and provisional can be seen simultaneously. This is how a Buddha or a Bodhisattva sees the world. One of the practices that Juri e uses to attain this perspective is known as the constant practice samadhi, wherein one constantly circumambulates a statue of Amitabha and recites the name of the Buddha. This practice is carried out for 90 days and leads to a vision, a visionary experience wherein one realizes the ultimate unity of ordinary beings and Buddhas. Tiantai in China inspire Pure Land movements throughout East Asia and known as Tendai in Japan, uh, some scholars theorize that Shinran's monastic career began in a constant practice Samadhi Hall uh, on Mount Hie. <clears throat> Dogen is the famous founder of Soto Zen in Japan. Like Shinran, uh, Dogen practiced on Mount Hie and drew upon and departed from the Tiantai Tendai tradition. Dogen traveled to China to study, to, to study what cutting edge Buddhism uh, looked like. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> Dogen traveled to China to study, to study what cutting edge Buddhism looked like in China at the time. And, at the, and when he was there, he encountered the Cao Dong lineage, uh, one, uh, which we now know as Soto. So Cao Dong in Chinese, Soto in Japanese. Yeah. <clears throat> this teaching emphasizes the idea that practice as such does not lead to enlightenment, but rather practice reveals that enlightenment is already working in process. Like, um, <clears throat> Uh, practice is enlightenment. One story that Dogen draws upon is the story of polishing a tile. In this story, a student is diligently meditating and his uh, teacher asks him what he is doing. The student says he is meditating to become a Buddha. Later, the student finds the teacher polishing a tile. When the student inquires as to what the teacher is doing, the teacher says he's polishing a tile to create a mirror. The student says, that's impossible. And the teacher responds, just as it is impossible to polish a tile to make a mirror, meditation does not make you a Buddha. Boom, right? It's one of those great mic drop moments in Buddhist history. Yeah. <clears throat> just like how a mirror is uh, inherently luminous, so too is the inherent nature of beings. Buddhahood is already within and all around us. We just have to wake up to it. Within the broader East Asian flow of Chan in China, Son in Korea, Zen in Japan, diverse perspectives on the Pure Land flourished. One koan asks the meditator to concentrate on the phrase Nian Fo Shir She or Nian Fo Zhe Shir She, um, who recites the name of the Buddha. The point is perhaps to arrive at the truth that the Buddha reality is not separate from our practice, and thus there is no clear answer. East Asian Zen traditions often often emphasize the idea that uh, the, uh, the idea known as mind only pure land that the pure land is ultimately here and now, and Amitabha is our own practice uh, is our own uh, sorry Amitabha is our own mind as it truly is, and in fact for most Buddhists who practice in what we would call Zen, um, you know, you know pure land practice is one of the dominant forms. Just, you know one of the things you might do is chant the name of the Buddha contemplate the Buddha, aspire for pure land rebirth, but how that's understood can, can change depending on your perspective. <clears throat> Dohan was another contemporary of Shinran, like Dogen. I know it's hard. Dogen, Dohan, so Dohan, another guy, right? So Dohan uh, was another contemporary of Shinran and a theorist of East Asian esoteric Buddhism. Uh, he was a scholar of the works of Kukai, um, uh, and Kukai is often credited with establishing esoteric Buddhism at the very pinnacle of Japanese ritual culture in the early 9th century. Um, esoteric Buddhism emphasizes the idea that body, speech, and mind 
beings are participating in ultimate reality and through ritual empowerment or adhisthana one is able to, uh, to to realize this truth adhisthana is often translated as empowerment or or even grace and signifies the idea that our practice manifests the power of buddha reality and in some sense depends upon buddha on mount hiei by shinran's time esoteric buddhism was a dominant force and the constant practice hall was seen as as a highly esotericized practice uh, that had spread all over japan including mount koya the site of kukai's tomb and where dohan's career uh, largely took place Dohan's famous text, the Himitsu Nembutsu Sho, or a compendium on the esoteric Nembutsu, argues that Amitabha Buddha is the compassionate activity of Dharmakaya, manifesting as the very breath of life that enlivens beings, rendering, you know, uh, rendering practice possible at all. Like Shenron, Dohan sees Amitabha and the Pure Land as the ocean to which all streams ultimately return. In this way, other power is almost like a gravity that draws all beings to ultimate liberation in the land of bliss. In one section, Dohan says that no self is the great self. In other words, when we see the fluidity of our self nature, when the boundaries we impose upon our reality are broken down, we see that the true nature of mind is extensive, coextensive with ultimate reality. Now, we arrive at Shinran, perhaps the figure that many of you are more familiar with. I find that Shinran is often read in isolation uh, from his contemporaries like Dogen and Dohan, and the Pure Land tradition is often read in isolation from the many mutually influential Mahayana traditions like Zen or Esoteric Buddhism or Tiantai and so on. When we read across traditions, we find that these various perspectives may not necessarily rhyme, but they certainly have a certain harmony. Part of what makes Shinran's approach so radical is that he shifts agency away from the calculating mind, Hakarai, right, uh, of ordinary beings, uh, based on his experience with the elite monastic centers of his day, or Mount Hiei. Shinran seems to have felt that even, if not especially, religious aspirants uh, are all too easily tainted by ego. <clears throat> Perhaps in response to the chaos of his day, Shinran felt that the capacities of beings were in decline, and the only hope we have to rely on uh, is that of other power, the compassionate activity of Dharmakaya. Ultimate reality is ultimately active within and all around us, guiding us home. Therein, the tale of Dharmakaya, the dynamic living symbol of Amitabha Buddha, is a way to give form to the formless so that afflicted beings may get a foothold and progress along the path. Shinran refers to the Nembutsu as a non-practice. If by practice we think of ourselves as independent agent, then the Nembutsu is something else. For Shinran, not only the successful practice of the Nembutsu, but even the practice of Nembutsu itself is the activity of Buddha within us, uh, through us. Nembutsu is the activity of Dharmakaya's compassion guiding beings to awakening and with that i will go ahead and conclude um this is a brief sketch of some things that i've been working on giving a um um broader integrated view of some of the different buddhist traditions that flourish within japan i think many of us especially when we first begin our studies of, of buddhism tend to break things up you know, over here is Zen, over here is Pure Land, over here is Tendai, over here is Esoteric Buddhism. But in Shinran's day, these things all flow together. And when you read the biographies of the great monks and great teachers, you often find that they've spent a lot of time studying different things, or a particular temple may have practitioners from many different lineages all living and working together. Um, and even though other power is one of these concepts we tend to associate with one kind of Buddhism, it's actually broadly you know, broadly found you know, Mahayana concept that I think gives us an opportunity to think and talk more broadly uh, across traditions. So with that, I'll go ahead and conclude. Um, yeah, well, thank you for your time today.